Amen. Are you ready for the word? Come on, come on. Are you ready for the word? Are you awake? Family chapel. Amen. A couple of years ago, I was a struggling young man. And the same things I've said to you here today, I've learned it very true in my life. I had no direction. I had no purpose. But one thing I knew was that I had been called by God. But as to what I should do, I didn't know. Where I should go, I didn't know. And the first thing I realized was God says, come back to Kumasi. So I had to come to Kumasi. And when I got to Kumasi, I started going to CCC. And then I needed somebody in my life. And my senior brother called me and said, you need to see Reverend Douglas Frimpong. So I came to Edom, and he was going out. He put me in his car. And I'll never forget our conversation. He was asking me questions, probing what I believed in. And I was answering him. I told him how God called me and how I had left school. And then he called my older brother later and said, your brother is on fire. And my brother called me back and said, this is what Reverend Douglas said about you, that you are on fire for the Lord. Now it changed my life and my perspective. And when everybody did not believe in me, he chose to believe in me. Everybody needs somebody to mentor them. And in reality, that was my first true great mentor and my father. He was one of the first people who invited me into his pulpit. And I can never forget the message I preached there those three days at Book Room Fellowship, Christian Outreach. I preached about desire. And he made me believe in myself. We all need somebody who makes us believe in ourselves. Look into somebody's face and said, Who makes you believe that you're worth it? Somebody must make you believe that you are worth it. And he made me believe you are worth it. That is why every year I want him to come for a couple of Sundays and bless. Because he will always leave a good word and a blessing here. I am proud as we rise to our feet to welcome to the podium the Reverend Douglas Okona Frimpong, Dr. Okona Frimpong of Christian Outreach Ministries. First of all, I am very grateful to God for the opportunity I have uh, today to be back here at Family Chapel. I keep saying this, and I mean it from the depth of my heart. That if I was a young man growing up in the city of Kumasi, and I'm looking for a church where I can worship God in spirit and in truth, without a doubt, Family Chapel will be my first choice. I love the worship. And let's give a hand to our worshipers. I mean, and uh, you really blessed my heart. God bless you. Uh, a very renowned man of God in this city. I had a chance to be with him. Uh, he wrote for me uh, when I was publishing the Christian Outreach magazine some years ago. And uh, he, he spoke about a very expensive joke. They went to a conference. 
And he sat by a Muslim. He sat by a Muslim. And uh, they were eating. And it was a Friday. And it was a Friday. And uh, they asked the, the Muslim was not eating a certain dish. And he asked him, Oh, well, can't you take, won't you take a bite? And he said, I'm a Muslim. I, we don't eat this. And he said to the Muslim, I don't think you know what you are missing. <laughs> you don't know what you are missing. <laughs> In the course of the conversation, the Muslim asked him, "Are you married?" He said, "No, I'm a father. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't marry. I don't have a wife." And then the Muslim also said to him, "My goodness, you don't know what you are missing." <laughs> and that's the point I have here. When you have a young pastor who believes in God, who is word based, full of faith, and believes in the supernatural. If you don't take him serious, you don't know what you are missing. And I'm glad. To be back to fam, back now, at family chapel. I shared in the first service, and I want to repeat myself. Let's open our Bibles to Second Corinthians chapter five and verse seven. Second Corinthians chapter five and verse seven. For we walk by faith. Not by sight. For we walk by faith, not by sight. For the past few weeks, I've been made to understand that we've been talking about the believer's walk of faith. Our walk of faith. And I want to talk about that this morning. I've been preaching the gospel for the past five zero years. And uh, I love my walk with God for the past 50 years. Some 51, 52 years. And if I were to repeat my life, if we had a chance, I still live by faith and walk with God. I won't change my profession. I still preach the gospel. I studied accountancy. Worked five months at, at KNUST at the cost office. And then came into the ministry. I came to Kumase. 40 years ago, 48 years ago. And I've been here since then. I came to study. From Jabeng. Born at Asamankese. Came back to Kumase. And I've stayed since I came to study and haven't gone back. Build a family here. And I'm happy to be what I am today. Amen. Amen. Because God picked me from a very humble beginning. No, I didn't say that. My father was fabulously rich. <laughs> yes. He was fabulously rich. He had a four-mile cocoa farm. And when I was born, he had three-story buildings. 
three story buildings and other buildings Any adanye, four adanye, other buildings some he bought Ebi, what and owned them uh, and so he was rich Nachese, but he died when I was 18 so and so with that kind of background my sister took over my education because my uncle in a Santi we say my father or actually my uncle my, my father's brother who took over the reign of our friends I was on scholarship because God gave me some brains. So all he had to pay was my transport to school, in secondary school. And probably the books I took from the bookstore. Toilet rolls and other things that the school had to charge me. But I didn't have to pay much. Anytime my school bill comes, you look at the bill. He pays exactly what is on the bill. Yeah, no pocket money, nothing. Sometimes even no transport. And my mother had to struggle to send me to school. So my elder sister took care of me. And looking at that background, I could go to school with one anto bag of gari and three dozens of uh, sardines and three dozens of uh, milk, you know? And then I, when my father died, I had to break, beg for a cake of soap. So looking at my background, it is just by the grace of God that I'm what I am today. But when I became a Christian, God showed me a vision. I was in a meeting like this. The number was bigger than this. And the number may be 10 times or 20 times the number we have here. Then they called me to the pulpit. They mentioned my name, I went up there. And they gave me a certificate. As big as this wall. And there was only one word on that certificate. When I opened it, that word was Kumasi. i would never been to Kumasi. By then, and I came to Kumasi in 1973. And I've not gone back. I've lived here, built here, built a family here, built a church here, built wonderful fellowship of people. And I thank God for that. I had a privilege to work with Morris Rillo. He first invited me to a crusade in Accra. Had a crusade in Accra in the late, I think, late, late 70s, yes. Not early 70s, late 70s. Then after that, he gave me a scholarship to go to study in Kenya. After that, he gave me another scholarship to go to the States with my wife. At the World Outreach Bible, a World Outreach School of Ministry. Now, six months of three sessions a day. Seven o'clock in the morning. To 12 noon. Then we had lunch. And an hour and a half of siesta. Resting here. Two o'clock we go back. We are there until 5.30. Six o'clock we have supper. Seven o'clock we had our finishes. Seven to nine. 
This went on for six months. And we had the privilege of having most of the men and women who are renowned preachers of the gospel in the world to come and teach. They challenge us. Challenge. Challenge. Over 600 students from nearly 52 or so countries. 600 and over. We were close to about 640, 650. I'm not too sure about the number. And during this period, I learned how to walk by faith. So after graduation, most of us who left the first session of School of Ministry, World Outreach School of Ministry, we all believe that we can take the world in about two days. And so, when I came back, came back in September 1979. September 1979. In December, on December 30th, I was on my way to Los Angeles for a crusade. I was supposed to have a crusade in Los Angeles and another one in the Philippines. Now I Los Angeles and about Philippines. I didn't have money to go. But the training we had and the challenge we received from the, the renowned men of God, I understood that if you walk by faith, there's nothing you can do. So I had to trust God and go by faith from here to the States and then from the States to the Philippines. And then the plan was that from the Philippines we go to Brazil to have mass evangelistic crusades all by faith. Now, some of the things I'm going to share with you for a brief moment, you must be very certain that God has called you to do them. Because some of them are very crazy. I was a young evangelist. And I worship at Central Assemblies of God. Central Assemblies of God, the line was there for 10 years as an evangelist. But listen. I was supposed to go from here to Los Angeles. I had no money. I settled at Bokro Estate where I invited a pastor to come. My wife and I had just returned from Los Angeles. Beautiful shoes, always, always beautiful shoes. Nice jackets. Nice pair of suits. I had some few children then. Few. So that gives you an idea that I have many now. <laughs> And these children will have ribbons in their hair and their dresses were foreign. But we, we had no money. We have gone to a new place, we had no money. No bank account. We need bank account. We have to live day by day. We have to come to Central Assemblies of God. Some of the days we literally, with two children or three children, neatly dressed, myself neatly dressed, my wife neatly dressed, but no money. If, even for trotro. We just began the ministry. Nobody knew us. We stand in a trotro at Bokrom, believing God to take us to church and back. We had no money for transport. But we'll go anyway. We pray in the morning and set out and join the queue. We take the trotro. One time we were in the queue, 
we joined when the, when the trotro came we all joined and left with them but we had no money to pay for the trotro and i was that's the time when the trotro mates will come to you and say uh -huh. and they take the money before you join the trotro when it gets to attend, somebody from the back will say, meet your mama, and will pay for myself, for my wife, and for all the children. I've literally gone from Kumasi to Accra with that same faith and back. Sat in an STC bus with no money in my pocket knowing for sure that God was with me to take me them back. That's why I'm saying some of the things, don't try them if God has not told you to do that. But one thing that really challenged me was my trip to the state for a crusade and to the Philippines and back to Ghana. God used that to train me as a young evangelist. I had an invitation for a crusade in Los Angeles. A colleague of mine invited me to come to join him for a mass crusade. I didn't have money. I prayed. God led me to my sister who was then in the army. The one who took care of me when my father died. I told her that God has sent me for a crusade overseas. I said, I know you don't have money. I have some money in my account. So she provided enough money to give me a one-way ticket from here to London. So I went and purchased a ticket. Accra, London. One way. And I prayed. I went for a visa. They gave me the visa. I joined the flight. I had two young men. One was going to Canada, to university students. The other one was going to um, to university in England. I witnessed to them. One sat on my right, the other sat on my left. And in the flight, I witnessed to both of them. And they gave their lives to Christ. So, when we arrive at, land, at Heathrow, they, in the course of our conversation, they realized that I had a one-way ticket to London. The one going to London asked me, uh, do you live here? Are you a resident? And I said, no, I'm, a divine, I'm on a divine assignment to, to the, the States and to the Philippines. He said, you have a one-way ticket. I don't think that they will allow you to enter. So when we go to Heathrow, the first one going to Canada, went. they asked him for his passport, they asked him for his ticket, they stamped and they allowed him to go. The guy who was also going to uh, London to the university in London. He also they asked for his passport. They asked for his ticket. They allowed him to go. So they were anxiously waiting there, praying for me. They are my new converts. <laughs> and so they were praying, knowing that I had a one way ticket. I went to the immigration officer. The first question he asked me, he said, what, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a preacher. He said, good. He said, give me your passport. He didn't ask for a ticket. My ticket was finished anyway. He stamped six, six months visa. I came out. And the one who was going to Manchester University, he said, what happened? I said, nothing happened. 
They didn't question me about your one-way ticket. I said, no. He said, what do I do? I said, I'm a preacher. And uh, he just stamped my passport. So let's see. He, said, he gave you six months. This is a miracle. Listen. We are all on assignment. There is a purpose for your life. And if you understand that God has a purpose for your life. And you believe this word. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. I say nothing is impossible. The sky is your limit. Because what is impossible with man. Is possible with God. Because with God all things are possible. All things are possible for those who believe. So walking by faith, our journey by faith, there will be a lot of challenges and obstacles in the way. But you must understand that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you, if you want to embark on this journey of faith, first of all, you must know Jesus personally as of Savior. Secondly, you must be a man of this book. If I can point to one thing that has been a real blessing to me as a Christian and as a minister of the gospel, it is this book. Let's give Jesus a clap of faith. Is this this? And my personal quiet time. My personal quiet time. A short period during the day that I set aside to read my Bible, to pray, and commune with God. We live a very busy life. And some of us, we don't have time for quiet time. We have no set time that we commune with God on a daily basis. We can go into most of our homes. We find a beautiful decorative picture. Christ is the head of this house. The silent listener to every conversation. The silent listener to every conversation. The unseen guests at every meal. The unseen guest. It sounds good. But there's no devotion in the family. If there's anything that has really helped me, my own personal quiet time and my family devotion, I don't joke with that. I don't joke with that. In all these years, our family devotions have always been on track. As young as seven years, I make sure that my children also know and lead devotion at home. I remember one time we were having a family devotion. What I normally do, we have a family roster. I will lead Say on Monday, my wife will lead on Tuesday. My eldest son will lead the third day. Then the next child will lead. And we are many, so we can cover the week. And sometimes have some days over. And some days over. We spill over seven days because we are more than seven. One day the youngest child who was seven years. My, my youngest child. Son. He was seven years old. We are having family devotion. He was his turn to lead the devotion. He opened the Bible. Quoted the scripture. Read the scripture. Then these were his words. I went to quote him. I say, I'm a seminar, I can kind of. 
And you will be bika kana ya mumpa ye. We just we just read the, the word of God that if anybody has anything to say, the person should say so, so yeah. that we pray. The Lord, the word of the Lord has come to us. If you have anything to say about any comment, just make your comment and then let's pray. That was his devotion for the day. And if I was a teacher, I would give him 99.9%. Because half a loaf is better than nothing. Half a loaf is better than nothing. And so, of my family, every child will have to learn how to lead a devotional style. So, if we want to walk by faith, we must bring our family along. A husband must bring his wife along. A wife must bring his husband and children along. But that is a very difficult task. Especially, especially here in Asante. We have, we have an action that says that Oba Eye Ujanya Bebane Chinetong <laughs> if a woman rears a sheep, it is the man who sells the sheep. If a woman has a gun, it's the husband who keeps it. They say. Now these are some of our traditional beliefs. It is good. It is biblical because the man is the head of the family. But a humble wife who knows the Lord, even if your husband is not a believer, with humility and service, you can bring your husband and children along. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. And so family devotions are important. So that your life will center on the word. Faith comes by hearing. By hearing by the word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. So all my life, on a daily basis, I make sure I read this word. I make sure I meditate on this word. I make sure my heart and mind is fixed on God through his word. I make sure I open myself to the Holy Spirit to guide and to direct me. And every day I pray and I say, God, this is a day you've made. I will rejoice and be clad in it. So the journey of faith will face all kinds of obstacles and challenges. But I don't look at this Challenges I face. I used to call them problems. I don't call them problems anymore. I call them challenges. Challenges and obstacles that must be surmounted. And I use these challenges as stepping stones believing God to go to the next level. Sometimes we make mistakes. But you must not allow your mistakes to keep you back. Don't allow your past to change you, put you in a straight jacket, break yourself free. I say break yourself free. When you fail today, it doesn't mean that's the end of your life. Do you, do you know that His Excellency our Prime Minister, President, he was Prime Minister, Busia, he wrote his English O level more than seven or eight times before he passed. Prime Minister of Ghana, Busia, and he said, his O level, but he ended up a professor of English. So when you fail, that's not the end of your life. When you have obstacles and challenges about where you want to go, that's not the end of your life. Believe God and persist. 
Perseverance will bring you over your challenges. He wrote his own level more than seven times before he passed. But he ended up a professor of English and taught the British, taught white people English their own language. Wrote many books. Do not allow the challenges and the obstacles in your life to impede your life. Put you in a straight jacket. No, 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 no. no, no. The challenges will come. Negative circumstances will come. But don't look at the negative circumstances. If you dwell and focus on your mistakes and obstacles and negative circumstances, the devil will use them to overcome you. But look beyond the obstacles. Look beyond the mistakes. Look beyond the challenges you face. Look beyond the negative circumstances and see the bigness of your God. When you see the bigness on your, of your God and focus on the bigness of your God, then God will change your circumstances for the better. Not all at a time, but little by little and little, every little circumstance that God changes in your life will be a miracle. So when I got a one-way ticket, I traveled to London. When I arrived at London, I had 40 pounds, 45 pounds in my pocket. That was all the money I had. I had no ticket. I was on my way to Los Angeles. I called my friend who invited me for the crusade. And he said, Douglas, let me tell you the truth. We were, we were all students. He was also living by faith. He said, Douglas, I invited you by faith. And I'm trusting God for a ticket to bring you from London to Los Angeles. So pray with me that God will give me a uh, an agent that will give me, credit me a ticket for you. So I had to stay in London for a day. I locked my luggage in a locker. Those days, you can lock your luggage, pay for it, and take a key. At Heathrow. I did that, that. But when I came out, I saw a schoolmate that I've never met for many years. He said, Douglas, what are you doing here? I said, I'm on my way for a crusade in Los Angeles. He said, I came to see my landlord. He was supposed to have come with you on your flight. But I just checked from the uh, manifest. It's not there. So I have to go back home. And he asked me, where are you staying? I said, I don't know yet. He said, let me give you my card and my residential address. In case you need a place to sleep, then please come to me. So we parted. I waited and waited. I thought I was going to have the ticket. My friend called me and said, Douglas, it looks as if I won't be able to get a ticket for you. So keep praying. I haven't received a ticket yet. So keep praying. And wait. So I decided... It was getting to midnight. So I decided to take an underground train from Heathrow Airport to London Bridge. That was my first time in London. I didn't know that if you have to join the underground train, you need a map that will tell you where you have to drop off and the rest. I thought it was like Ghana. So, so I started in that train. There were some white folks, love birds. They were kissing themselves and doing all kinds of things. And I told them, please, I'm going to London Bridge. So when we get close there, I let you. They said, okay, okay. Oh, they were in love. They, they forgot about me altogether. By the time I realized they have already alighted somewhere. 
So I was in the train. I thought that the train would take me to London Bridge. Then at midnight, the train driver came to me and said, Sir, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to London Bridge. He said, Oh, you ought to have dropped at some point, but we are not going anywhere, so you have to come down. To make a very long story short, from midnight to about 4 a.m., winter time, that was December 30, 1980. I have to walk in the snow. I didn't have an overcoat. I didn't have a winter coat. That was very chilly. But from 12 o'clock to 4 o'clock, I walked on the street of London. And this period was a, a memorial time in my life. It was a challenge for me to endure that harsh weather. But that was the time I prayed the best prayers in my life. I called upon God. I quoted every scripture I know from the Bible. Every promise of the Bible. And I said, God, you've sent me on this assignment. I don't have a ticket to go to Los Angeles. My friend doesn't have a ticket. He's also trusting you for the ticket. I don't know when I'm leaving here. And now I don't know where I am. And I don't know where I'm going. If you are the God that called me, and if you have assigned me a job in Los Angeles and the Philippines, you've got to tell me where to go and lead me. I am leaning on your everlasting arms. That was the first time I heard the voice of God Physically, when God spoke to me like I'm speaking to you. Then God will speak to me and say, do you see that light there on your right side? Just go to that place. God was showing me how to listen to him without questioning. He got my entire attention. Sometimes God allows certain things to happen to us so that he can get our absolute attention. Those four hours, I prayed my best prayers. I quoted every promise in the Bible just to get close to God. And God answered my prayer. He will lead me, go to that place. And I'll go there and direct me to the next place. One time, I went to a place, it was a cab station. Taxi. And then when I said I was going to London Bridge and showed them the address, the driver was a white driver. He took me and said 40 pounds. So was a 40 pounds. He took me into the cab and, uh, the and, the and drove me for a while. And, uh, he looked at me. The Ghanaian boy who has been in London for the first time. I don't know, probably my, my clothes were not the best clothes. My manners were not the best manners. And he was afraid of me. So we got to a time and he said, I can't go again. And he dropped me right in the middle of the street. And I was lost more than ever. Then I prayed and said, God, I don't know what to do now. What do I do next? He said, listen to me. Go for about a mile. You will see a house there. On the left side. It has this color. Go to that house. Knock that door. Somebody will come to attend to you. It's just like Elijah at the, at the, at the brook. When the brook dried up, then God spoke to him and said, Elijah, I want you to go to a widow. Stay there. 
And when Elijah went there, Elijah put you home. The, widow, the widow was even looking for two sticks to cook. She didn't have much. Nah, Just a few drops of oil. And a handful of flour. That widow was also praying that God would take care of her and the child. Because the test tells us in that scripture that when Elijah went there and asked for water and then added that he should bring him some baked food that woman stopped and addressed him he knew he was a prophet of God he said man of God please as long as your law lives ah, that woman has some element of the knowledge of God he said, as long as your God lives your maid your servant has nothing but a few drops of oil and a handful, handful of flour I went out to pick two sticks to bake for my son and I. And after eating, we have no hope die. Then Elijah knew that God has sent him to bring the answer to this lady. And said, that say the Lord, just go. Use that handful of flour and a few drops of oil. Bake your cake. But be sure to bring it first to me. For that saith the Lord. That few drops of oil. And that handful of flour. Will never run out. Until the end. Of the famine. Sometimes when God asks us something. And demands something from, from us. He has a purpose. He has our interest at heart. Especially when it comes to fundraising in church to support God's work. Sometimes what you are going to use, what you are going to use, you've budgeted for them for that amount. And yet you trust God. That's where faith comes in. Faith is a fact. But it's also an act. It is action. The devil believes the word. But he doesn't act on it. We believe the word. And we act on it. That's the difference between us and the devil. When the devil tempted Jesus, he quoted Psalm 91. Psalm 91. Okay. He quoted it. So you bow before me. I'll give all this to you. Why? Because I have a purpose. 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 I that makes the difference. We know the scriptures. We believe the scriptures. We act on the scriptures. We know the word. We believe the word. We act on it. So my simple definition of faith is acting upon the word of God. Acting on the word. Doing what the word says. Being doers of the word. You can never be successful in the work of faith as a believer without acting on the word. And you can't act on the word unless you know it and you believe it. That's why some of the New Testament writers said the patriarch, the old people believed and spoke and so do we believe and speak. We know it. We believe it. We speak it. We act on it. That is the work of faith. Knowing the word is not enough. 
Not all who call me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. But those who do what the Father demands. So let's act on the word. There will be challenges. There will be obstacles. There will be negative circumstances. We will look at those negative circumstances. We will believe the word. We will believe the promise of God. We will act on the promise of God. Then faith will take shape. Someone has said. A step of faith. Is not a step in the dark. A step of faith is not a step in the dark. Why? Because God will meet you where you step when you step in the dark. God will meet you there. We have a seen world. This fiscal world. And an unseen world. So we don't depend too much on this seen world. We depend on what we do not see. And hope is always in the future. We hope in God. And so we have hope in the future. That God will come to our aid. Because he has promised us in his word. And we stand upon the word. Believe the word. And act on the word. And that's what the faith, faith walk is all about. I walked. I got home between four and five. One until you could do fear. I called my friend in the States. I've prayed for almost four hours. My friend just called me. He said, Douglas, I am at a travel agency now. Who is prepared to credit me your ticket? He just gave the ticket to me. But you see, it's a budget fair ticket. It's a budget fair, a discounted ticket. And you have to be on the flight. Otherwise, you can use it again. So early in the morning, I went to British Airways office. I went there around 11. I asked for my ticket. For many minutes, they couldn't find my name. On the, on, the, on the PC. It took a very long time. They were able to find my name on the ticket. I have to do some calls back and forth to the state before they identified the code and gave me the ticket. When they gave me my ticket, I had one hour to be on the flight. I was in downtown London. I was supposed to go to Heathrow. And I have to go by public bus. Bus transport. I have to go by bus. And they told me, Douglas, it looks as if, if you are not careful, you are going to miss this flight. Because taking the bus from this office to Heathrow, that's exactly what happened. When I got to Heathrow Airport, I saw that the flight was leaving. Then I prayed and said, God, all night you spoke to me and gave me direction as to what to do. I know you have an assignment for me in Los Angeles. I am on divine assignment. So please, let me be on this flight because this ticket is a budget fair ticket. I have to strike to get to the gate. I went and picked my luggage from my locker and ran to the gate. By the time I got there, I was supposed to leave. My scheduled time, I was late by 30 minutes. And when I got to the boarding gate, I went to the flight. The flight attendants came to me and said, you are Douglas? He said, yes. He said, we put this flight on hold for 30 minutes. Just waiting for you. You are the one we are waiting for. So please, rush. He took my bag and rushed, in, rushed me in. And I got a flat to Los Angeles. When I arrived at Los Angeles, the other challenge that I faced 
Is that because I had a one-way ticket and didn't have enough money? The immigration officer took my passport and said that I should go to San Diego immigration office on the 7th of January. Because I was there on the 31st. Gave me seven days to report there. With my friend that invited me. So I went to the immigration office. The charge of the immigration officer was that my friend didn't have enough money in his account to take care of me for six months. You don't own a house. You rent a house. So you don't have enough money to invite somebody into the country for six months. No, he's coming, coming to preach. So but you, don't what, you don't have what it takes to invite him. So I'm going to send him back to Ghana. I say we face obstacles and challenges, but none of these things should bother you. So I looked at the immigration officer and I said, are you a Christian? He said, we are not talking about Christianity. We are talking about the laws of America. Your friend who invited you doesn't have enough. And I said, I'm called as a preacher. I know God has called me to preach in this nation. And from here, I'm supposed to go to the Philippines for another crusade. If I have to go to my country, I have nothing to lose. Maybe you are the only one God sent me to America to witness to. Are you a Christian? He had a pipe in his hand. He had a pipe. And he dropped the pipe. And there was a lit in his face. And so I knew God was speaking to him. I witnessed to him and led him to Christ. He accepted Jesus personal Savior. His testimony was this. That he used to go to church but for a full week his pastor preached about hell and it annoyed him and he decided not to go to church again because he wasn't, he wasn't living a good life so he said mm. and that day he said I'm happy that you've gotten me back on track and he gave me six months to stay in America. Two days after that, we finished the crusade and I went back to the Philippines. I left America two days after that. I didn't use the six-month visa. In the Philippines, when we got there, my money was finished. At the airport, we asked the taxi driver we took that he should take her to a charismatic church where we can worship God in spirit and in truth. The taxi driver took us to United Methodist Church in the very center of Manila. When I reached there, I realized that I was not in a charismatic setting. I realized that I wasn't in a charismatic setting. On the signboard in front of the church, I saw Reverend and Mrs. Soriano. They were the pastors. I looked at my yearbook and there was Mrs. Soriano. It was my mate at World Outreach School of Ministry in San Diego. So I went to the pastor. I went to the pastor. That was the husband. And I asked, please, I'm looking for Mrs. Soriano. He said, that's my wife. And then I understood why the taxi driver took me to United Methodist Church. You see, sometimes, sometimes we don't understand God. You don't have to understand him. He has a plan. 
He knew you when you were a clot of blood in your mother's womb. He knows the end from the beginning. And so when you depend on him and walk by faith and believe his word, he knows what to do with you at every angle of your life. So depend on him. Rest in him. Believe his word. So he said, just go to the church and let's after service, we try and find you a place to sleep. What I'm going to say, you wouldn't like to hear. Because they had a university right there. Now, attached to the church. United Methodist University College. United Methodist University. And so they gave us rooms there. It was a women's university. So they put us with the women. Though they were matured, but it was dangerous. <laughs> to make a long story short, we were supposed to have the first crusade in Bakolo City. On Negroes Island, in the Philippines. So we're supposed to fly from Manila to Bacolor City. We set up the crusade in Manila. But we had to go to Bacolor City for another crusade before we come back to Manila for the major crusade. There were times when we went to the airport empty handed for a ticket. We have some of our friends go to the airport with us. But I don't know. As to today, I don't know. We needed money to buy a ticket to go to Bacolor City from Manila. When I came back to the university and went to my room, there was an envelope pinned to my door with my name on it. And there were enough pesos in that envelope to fly the two of us from Manila to Bacolor City. This God we serve is a miracle working God. I have walked with him for 50 years. He had never failed me once. You can trust him. I say you can walk by faith and not by sight. You won't look at the negative circumstances. But you believe his word and his promises. For his promises are yes and amen. There are three things that I want to end with. To help you in your walk of faith. Number one. When you walk by faith, you have to learn. You have to learn. You have to learn how to guard your heart. You have to learn how to guard your heart. Thoughts are spiritual seeds. They are the starting point of what eventually manifests in your life. Your thoughts determine how you react to situations and how you carry yourself in the world. The things you think about also affect how you feel. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, let's read Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Finally, brethren, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things 
are of good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Guard your heart. And Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, guides us some of the things that should occupy our thoughts. Things that are true things that are honest things that are just things that are lovely things that are of good report things that are of virtue and praise these are the things we are supposed to think about as believers who walk by faith Hallelujah. Amen. So guard your heart. And think about some of these things. And many times. When we are desiring with difficult situations. Difficult situations. When we are dealing. Dealing with difficult situations. We are bombarded by negative thoughts. And these thoughts include worry. And doubt. If you doubt, you'll not receive any good thing. Something that differentiated Peter from the rest of the disciples was when he saw Jesus walking on water. So who said Christ to He said, Jesus, I want to come. If that's you, I want to come. And Jesus said, Come. So whatever Jesus did, you can do it. If you will not doubt but in the middle of his walk of faith walking on water he thought about himself he thought about the density challenge and when he doubted he began to sink so don't doubt don't doubt the ability to perform what he has promised he would do believe his word and act on it so guard your heart guard your heart don't doubt don't worry you see Matthew in Matthew Jesus in his in his teaching on the mount, his sermon on the mount, he said we should not think about what we will eat and what we will drink and what we wear. And compared us to birds, so birds they don't have farms. The lilies are beautiful, but you see, you are more precious to God than the bird, but they eat every day. Your heavenly father, your heavenly father, he personalizes it. He said, your heavenly father takes care of them. Human beings are the only species of God's creation who have anxiety and worry about things. And he says, no, don't worry. For seeing how who don't think about tomorrow, tomorrow. And we me, think about itself. It doesn't that? mean don't plan. But I'm already saying that don't look at the negative circumstances. God will take care of them. Keep going by faith. God will take care of them. So guard your heart. Number two. Confession. You must mind your confession or mind your mouth. It's easy to say that you are trusting God. I'm waiting on him. But while you are waiting, what are you saying? Are you speaking faith about the situation or are you giving voice to doubt and fear? Your words yes, must yes. demonstrate your belief that God is working on your behalf. And that's what Matthew chapter 12 and verse 37 
is saying. By your words, you'll be justified or condemned. Because the very words you speak out of your mouth will work in your favor or they will work against you. It is up to you to decide. It is up to you to decide. So guard your heart. Focus on the word and his promises of God. Then watch your confession. The third thing is action. Action. Faith is a fact. But faith is also an act. So the word of God tells us that faith without works is dead. And this means that we can't simply pray and then delegate our work to God. He's not going to come down from his throne and do what he has given you to do. God has given us power and ability. When the disciples went two by two, when Jesus sent them to Jerusalem, the 70 disciples. They came back testifying of great things that they were able to accomplish in this name. And he said, don't rejoice about it. This is, these are byproducts. Be glad that your names are written in the Lamb's book Because I saw Satan like lightning fall from heaven. So you have overcome him. Yes, we have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. And nothing, he emphasized, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. So let's believe God's word. Guard your heart. Focus on the word. Make sure your personal quiet time and devotion is important to you. Watch your confession. Act upon the promise of God. Faith means acting. Faith means action. Acting on the promises of God. And the songwriter says, acting on the promises of God. We cannot fail. We cannot fail. Especially when it comes to giving. Some of us, we are very good Christians. We have all the Christian virtues. What we lack is the ability to trust God with our finances. And God taught me that on that trip to the Philippines and back. I've said this before here. I'll say it again. Because of generational gap. Generational gap. That's right. Because at the time I was here, some of you may not hear. When I shared that testimony, some of you may not be here. Because of that generational gap, I want to fill it in. After four major crusades or so in the Philippines, getting passes that governmental, uh, uh, the government has just said that nobody can use the grounds for religious violence because of Muslims and Christians in the Philippines. By faith, we go to President Marcos' office and we get a presidential approval to use it after it had been banned for two years. And after a crusade, the people of the Philippines had a chance to use the plaza. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The first time God challenged me to learn how to give was in a service. It was a Sunday evening service. Sunday evening service. Wow. It was an offering time. My host has introduced me to the pastor. 
the pastor invited me on Sunday evening to share what happened in the Philippine Crusades. I shared with the congregation some of the great things God did. After the service, they were taking an offering. All the money I had was $10. One note, $10. And I was to decide whether to give it or save it. I had just returned from the airport. So that's all the money I had. $10, one note. $10. We were taking an offering. Deep down in my heart, something was saying, don't give it. Another voice was saying, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This was my last. So you can imagine. After the service, I have to go home. I have to take a bus home. But I heard the voice that came from the Spirit of God. That is more blessed to give than to receive. So I gave that ten dollar note. After the service, the pastor came to me and said, "Douglas, that was a powerful testimony." God bless you. See you. And I said to myself, what kind of a pastor is this? You invite someone to come and preach. After he preached, you just come and shake and you don't ask him whether he whether he has enough to go back home, what kind of transport he came. You leave him right just like that. So I was completely lost. Now no money in my pocket. I was back to Batan. I have to trust God again to go home. I was in that auditorium. I was praying that God would touch somebody hard. Everybody was leaving. Everybody left. The janitor of the church came putting off the heat and the light. Came to me and said, Sir, we, we are done. We, please, could you just go out, so step out so that I can close the door? The weather outside was cold. I went out to the lobby. Then I saw a car coming. It was one Mr. Miller, 56 year old. He came to me and said, You are Douglas. I said, Yes. So said, You are the one that just preached. I said, Yes. He said, I was looking for you outside. Because I don't, I don't belong to this church. I drove 200 miles to come to this church. After church service, God spoke through my wife in a prophecy and gave her the address of this church to come here. And God spoke to us and said that there's someone who is coming to this church who has a financial need and we must come and help that guy. And when we were preaching, when we were preaching I sensed in my spirit that you are the one. So after the service, I was looking for you. You see, sometimes we look for support from the wrong place. Let's lean on the everlasting arms. Let's call upon him. And he will answer. He gave me his card. Took me home. And he said, you hear from me. That was Sunday night. When I went home, I spent Sunday night, Monday, the whole of Monday, the whole of Tuesday, in prayer. So that that's where we go wrong. We stop short. I was prepared to pay whatever price. Because he told me he doesn't live in the neighborhood. He drove 200 miles. So if he decides not to come again, that's it. But I stayed in prayer and said, God, if you really send this man to me What's to help me financially, then let him drive back another 200 miles to see. On Wednesday morning at 9, I received a call from him. It was his wife, Mrs. Miller. 
He said, is this Douglas on the phone? I said, yes. He said, God gave me a word that we should come to San Diego. And that's why my, my husband came to see you. And then I sensed in my spirit that I should pray for her. And I said, mom, can I pray for you? She said, sure, 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 sure. Then I started praying. And in my prayer, I took authority over the life of this lady. About two to three minutes, I was really praying for her. In the course of the prayer, I realized that she dropped the receiver. She started saying, Jesus, Jesus, and then the husband came on the line. And the, the, Mr. Bila said, Douglas, are you still on the phone? I said, yes. He said, Douglas, something miraculous happened here. He said, I now understand why God spoke to us to come to San Diego. I now understand why I drove 200 miles to come to see you. Understand that we are mere instruments in the hands of God. We are mere instruments. We do not heal. It is the Holy Spirit who heals. The virtue comes from Jesus. Now I don't understand why I came to see you. My wife was blind for the past 10 years. And while you were praying, God just healed her completely. And he said, wait, I'm coming. You see, there are certain things that money cannot do. You may have all the money at the bank. But a certain aspects of your life, it takes God to change the situation. There are certain circumstances, only God can do that. And that's exactly where Mr. Miller and his wife were. He took me out. See, took me to the bank, bank. Gave me money. Umaniska. Took me to Montgomery my Ward. It was a, a, a big departmental store. Hey, baby, yeah, he, did he said, Douglas, I have a credit card. Credit Whatever card. you want, please pick it. Don't be bashful. He filled two Samsonite bags full of items. You ask me, bags. your wife, your, his, her bust, uh, and there are certain husbands who do not know the bust of their wives. Send you will be in be bad be shape. And God will not perform a miracle if you don't know the past of your wife. I knew all her statistics. You need to know. I've been with her all this year. I must know. Hello? Are you there? And he asked me, do you have a special present you want to give to your wife? The point that I want to say here is that God used him to meet every financial need I had. I wasn't expecting. There was no need to run around preaching. Every need was met financially. Things, clothes, and other things I have to give to my children or my trip. Everything was supplied. When it comes to giving, let's trust God. Let's close our eyes. I want to pray. There are some of you who are watching by Facebook Live. And those who are here in this auditorium. This may be the first time you are here in this auditorium. Or this is the first time you'll be watching. You've heard this message. Deep down in your heart. You are saying, God, I've done what is right in my own eyes for too many years. I've done what is right in my own eyes for too many years. There is some emptiness in my heart. I want you to come into my heart and be the Lord and Savior of my life. And I want to accept you as my personal Savior and Lord. Lord, please come into my heart. Forgive my sins. And write my book in the Lamb's book 
of life. If this is your prayer, if you are here in this auditorium, or watching me by faith, if you are watching me by Facebook Live, or wherever medium you are using, I want you to raise your right hand and I want to pray for you. Listen to me again. You are here in this auditorium or watching me watching me by the internet. And your prayer is that God have lived my life the way I wanted it. There is some emptiness in my heart. I need you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I want to save you for the rest of my life. I open my heart to you. Come into my heart. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. If this is your prayer, please raise your right hand. I want to pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You may be in the comfort of your home watching me. God bless you there. I want you to say this simple prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for coming into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I want to live for you and serve you faithfully. Empower me by your Holy Spirit. Write my name in the book of life. Thank you for saving my life. I know because I've repented of my sins and accepted you as my Lord and Savior. Even if I die today, I know I'm coming to you in heaven. Thank you for this great miracle you have wrought in my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now I want to pray for you. Father, I thank you for these precious souls that have given their lives to you. Your word says that whoever comes to you, you will know us cast out. Bless them. Empower them to live for you from this moment onward. And I thank you for doing this. In Jesus' name. Amen.